Let me begin my discussion of The Pale Horse, which was written in 1962 with a story. Uh, years ago, a, a friend of mine lived with us in the house while she was going to medical school, and, and she had been an English major and so read novels for fun after she finished exams. And she read a lot of serious fiction, but she also, like the rest of us who were English majors, read a lot of detective fiction. And after she'd finished an examination, she said she wanted a good novel to read at night, and I gave her The Pale Horse, which I had just recently finished, and said, I really like this Agatha Christie novel. I think you will, too. And the next day, when I got up, she said, don't ever do that to me again. She said, this is not a usual Agatha Christie novel. And it does seem to me that The Pale Horse is on this list today primarily because it's not a usual Agatha Christie novel. In some ways it is. It's a novel that depends upon clues. It's finally a, a great misdirection novel. It's finally a novel in which instability and stability are juxtaposed against one another and stability finally wins relatively easily. It's a novel in which the villain who appears at some time to be a master criminal is finally revealed to be nothing more than a man dressed up in red tights like some kind of ham actor. But at the same time, the novel is also a kind of anti-Agatha Christie novel, as if in some way she were feeling at the time she was writing it, when she'd written many, many novels, a kind of uh, resistance to what she was doing. I think she may have felt tired of the same kinds of convention and interested in working with a new form in such a way as to, as to try a kind of different shape to this novel which, it seems to me, is different from other Agatha Christie novels in a number of important ways. It's a novel that uses a different narrator than, than uh, she usually uses and uses a different detective. It's not a narrator or a detective of super intelligence who resolves everything by the acts of ratiocination. It's a detective who is one of many amateurs working together with the police on a problem. It's a novel in which, instead of being set in a country village, the atmosphere is often in a city. It's a novel in which the first murder does not occur in a closed space or at a uh, church bazaar, but in fact is a murder accomplished on a London street at night, so there's not a limited number of suspects, but instead a very, very large possibility for suspects. It's a novel which focuses not on apparently a single killer who operates from motives of direct profit, but seems to be a novel initially where there are many killers and where the killers work by something like remote control or witchcraft or modern science or physics of one kind or another. So that it's a novel which seems to me to be one in which Agatha Christie is kicking against the conventions of the form she usually uses. And the way in which this novel is divided against itself seems to me to make it particularly interesting for our purposes. The setting is conspicuously modern, takes place in a coffee house in Chelsea at its beginning, in which we meet a narrator who feels, it seems to me, as a kind of surrogate for the novelist, uh, a, 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 a wash in this new world. It's as if Agatha Christie wants to write a different kind of novel, knows in order to do that she has to move into a different kind of world, and so moves into a coffee house in Chelsea, a place which Mrs. Oliver tells us she never writes about, and takes into that world a hero who in certain ways resembles her uh, uh, in ways that I want to talk about in a moment. But the, the uh, particular modern quality of that world, a modernness stressed in the opening pages of the narration when the character who was acting as the narrator, Mark Easterbrook, talks to us about his particular responses to the world he sees, talks to us about his alienation from this world of machinery that seems to him devil-like, almost demonic. It's a world where modern society imposes itself on one who would be more content in some way to be back working on, mo on, on mogul architecture and things like that. He's somebody who is in some way observing as an outsider 
the, the, the sort of activities of modern life and the modern world as he sits in this coffee house taking a break from the work he's writing. Even the language of the novel seems to be more symbolic than she usually gives us when she talks to us about the demonic quality of the language, when she talks to us about the danger in contemporary sounds, in the whole contemporary atmosphere, which seems to carry about it a kind of devilish sense that there's a mystery here we cannot strike through that threatens us. And in fact, the novel will eventually deal with the way in which the ordinary domestic life can be intruded upon by the forces of evil, not now remote control and superstition but in, or a deep death wish, but instead by poison which is introduced into the world of the character who is to be murdered by information gained about what kinds of uh, toothpaste or what kinds of mouthwash that character uses so that such a thing can be planted in the world of the character. It's a, it's, it's a novel about the intrusion into individual space of a modern world of technology and science which can make you dead and seems to be in contact with the demonic. It's a world also in which the language sometimes moves toward the very modern. The description of Mrs. Tuckerton, one of the murderers, murder by contract, is a description which in fact sounds very much like the writing we might find from Raymond Chandler. It doesn't sound like the usual Christie description. When Mark Easterbrook goes to see Mrs. Tuckerton, he reads her face, something which is extraordinarily interesting in Christie's novels because the usual convention of a Christie novel is that you can't read characters. You can't read their faces because anybody is a, is a, anybody is a possible killer and that faces don't show us much. Though in this novel and in many American novels, the skill of the detective depends on his capacity to read in faces particular qualities of mind and emotion. And that what this character reserve, what this character Mark Easterbrook sees when he goes to look at Mrs. Tuckerton is a face which, re which reveals its pettiness its greed, its small-mindedness, and perhaps its potential to do a murder if that murder can be made easy by being hired out to somebody else. Mrs. Tuckerton is somebody who has thin lips that seem bad-tempered, who has a receding chin, a face which is essentially a weak face, pale blue eyes which nervously look about as if it were appraising the price of things. And what he does is also tell us that this is the kind of face of somebody who consistently under-tipped porters and whom you see in, 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 a, in a shape like this, though not so well-dressed or so well-groomed and manicured all over the world. It seems to me a description that doesn't sound like the usual Christie and that touches upon at least the quality of writing that we'll see much more obviously in American detective novels. The other thing is, of course, that makes this novel different is that there is a murder-for-hire operation. This is not a single character working a murder by his own ingenuity for profit, at least apparently. Now, the fact is that the novel ultimately comes down to being that kind of form, but that within that form there is the suggestion of and actuality of a murder for hire organization which has in it a number of uh, administrative departments. There's the lawyer who makes the deal. There's the pale horse organization which operates the supernatural paraphernalia which turns out to be a stalking horse, the pale horse for the work. And there's also the uh, organization which goes around and collects information, the customer reactions classified organization, all of which work behind Osborne the killer as a way of giving him administrative ties to 
the, the people who want to make contracts for him to do killings. So that behind this novel, there's not only the suggestion of a darker quality of, of demonic forces operating by remote control or by supernatural forces or by a death wish, but also as well a sense that in this world, murderers can be found everywhere if we would just make it easy enough for us to be able to do it. The novel ends by locating Osborne as the killer, but in the process it, it ignores all of the implications of the fact that Mrs. Tuckerton has worked a deal with Bradley to see that her, uh, her stepdaughter is executed in one way or another, that all of the murders which Osborne accomplishes are murders which are suborned by somebody else. And so, in the world of the Pale Horse, we're dealing now with a mindset that implicitly should see corruption nearly everywhere, all over England, in Surrey, in London, in a small town here, in a large city there, and which sees people in one way or another who are close to somebody able to work a murder if they can hire it out. In the process, what begins as a kind of puzzle, as a problem which interests Mark Easterbrook and Ginger Corrigan and that they want to run down, ends up being something with which we as a reader and they as characters are also deeply involved. That this is a novel in which one of the victims is somebody we know where and know well and care a good deal about, Ginger Corrigan. And in fact, it seems to me that there is a quality in this novel which suggests to me the works of Alfred Hitchcock not only in its dealing with the supernatural, but in the way in which it draws in a relatively ordinary person into a world which turns out to be complexly evil and in which he finds himself on his own or dependent upon somebody else to help him work through the challenges met by, presented by that evil, and in the process, somebody drawn into it in such a way that we care a good deal about him and that this figure is not only a character we identify with, but is also perhaps a surrogate for, in part, the author herself, since Mark Easterbrook begins the novel by feeling himself in an, al an alien in a society that uh, he does not know well, and that as he looks at that society, he feels that there is a potential for evil operating almost everywhere in all of its modern machinery, for instance, and that those are characteristics that seem to me we might locate in Agatha Christie herself, who is in some way an outsider to the modern world, writing ordinarily about almost a Jane Austen kind of English country world, and who makes it her business to see the potential for evil everywhere as she writes one successful mystery novel after another. And Mark Easterbrook is also, we will remember, called to that coffee house because he's feeling revulsion from, the own, from his own act of writing. He is like Christie, a writer, and he is somebody who is at this moment feeling deep revulsion about what he's doing. As Christie herself, in the process of writing, must necessarily, it seems to me, sometimes have felt that. All of you who have written, even if it's only letters sometimes, know how terrible it is to feel that something you have spent a good deal of your time working on now reads back to you some, like something awful that you can't stand. And that it seemed to me Christie is at least working with this as a possibility, particularly since, in a way I'm going to talk about shortly, the novel also is self-reflexive, also brings a character like Agatha Christie to the forefront for her to see us, see, for, for us to see her. So that it seems to me in some way the novel is divided against itself and is two novels working simultaneously. In one case, we have a basic Agatha Christie novel of misdirection in which the murder is done by poison and in which there is essentially one killer. In the, who, who, who works by disguising his particular uh, activities behind the surface of a kind of generally interested good man. But in addition, we have a world of tremendous 
uh, modernism, a world of good size in which murder happens at almost any kind of time or any kind of place and involves a good many people and also engages as its principal detective and, dete and detective, detectiva, if you want to make a, a feminine of the detective, uh, as, as people we care about whom we've gotten to know. There, as a, as a consequence of this, other signs I want to talk about now. One is that there is a curious similarity in this novel between the killer and Christie's ordinary detective, as if there was a part of her getting out her aggression on Poirot, a character she might have been growing tired of for one reason or another, by making him here a kind of killer in disguise. For Poirot and Osborne have much in common. They both are comic in appearance. They both are short, unimpressive looking, but vain who are men who are bald and wear mustaches and dress in dapper ways and call attention to themselves as in some way grand when they are physically unimpressive. They are, in, in that way, artificial also in the manner in which they speak. Poirot, of course, talks in that gallicized English. And Osborne, the killer in this novel, has a kind of strangely formal speech that he gives and uses when he talks with Lejeune, when he comes to visit him in what Osborne calls his humble abode. Both of them are retired to a country cottage where they garden as they have flown from their previous work. Both miss the excitement of their earlier days. Both take pride in their great eye for detail and are vain about their talents, their intelligence, and their memory. Both finally are remorseless in the pursuit of a fixed idea. In this case, Osborne has, for some reason, decided that he is going to frame Venables by identifying him as the man he saw commit the murder of the priest, and that he persists in doing that in such a way as to suggest, of course, and we are, we are told finally, a man of incredible stupidity who will not let well enough alone, who in his pride should have known better and stayed away, but who could not resist bringing himself to the forefront of the investigation because finally he was so vain. That's the, that's the criminal side of him. But it's also possible, for instance, within the context of the novel, to see Osborne, the man who refuses to be turned aside by the apparent crippling injury or sickness that Venables has, has apparently suffered, polio, as a man who, if he weren't the killer, might really be a kind of remorseless detective determined to root out the fact that Venables is using his polio as a disguise and is in fact not really a polio victim at all. And in the world of Agatha Christie, as you all know, that, was, that is fully possible. Certain absurd things can happen all the time. And that, for instance, those of you who read Robert Ludlum know that the matter East circle depends upon the same kind of trick that a man who was supposed to be crippled has really fixed his med medical records and paid somebody else to sit there for him and is, in fact, using his, cri his, his crippling injury as a disguise when, in fact, he can move around freely. And that Osborne's persistence in this novel his refusal to be turned aside by the apparent untruth of his identification of Venables is from our perspective for a long time the possible persistence of the detective who refused to be turned aside as Perot ordinarily is and as in fact Mark Easterbrook is in this novel since early in the novel he begins to be suspicious and talks to both Corrigan and his girlfriend about the fact that this is making him uneasy and he thinks there's something very bad going on here and he doesn't quite understand how it's happening but it needs to be investigated and they essentially dismiss him as being carried away on an idea which is finally irresponsible and far-fetched. So that the persistence of Osborne in this, in this novel might just as well be the heroic activity of the dete detective, as it is for Easterbrook and as it is characteristically for Perot, rather than the particular um, stupidity 
of the vain killer who finally undoes himself because he's too proud of what he does. The crossroads of these two novels, the novel that Christie is writing in a kind of Christie vein, and the novel that she's working with that seems to me radically different from her earlier form, seem to me to be brought to a head in the moment when Ariadne Oliver calls Mark Easterbrook to bring to his attention an important clue and its meaning. Because at this point, it seems to me, if, if, if I may be so bold as to suggest it, that Agatha Christie has let her characters get out of hand, in part. That in the process of writing, she has given Ginger and Mark their heads, and they have proceeded on their plan to try to discover how these murders are done by pretending that Mark, the detective, is a murderer, as in another way, the man who appears to be a detective, Osborne, is in fact a murderer. Here, the man who pretends to be the murderer is the detective, goes to see Bradley to get his, quote, wife murdered to get rid of her when... Uh, that person is played by Ginger, and she gets uh, uh, affected by the poison which is introduced into her world in a, in, by Osborne in disguise, and is gradually dying. And in some way, the plot has here gotten out of Christie's hands, because if she leaves those characters to their own devices, Mark can't find out the answer. The clues have been left there for him all this time. There have been all these references to hair falling out, and Mark seems not to get them. Neither do we, perhaps. And at a very crucial moment in the investigation, when Ginger is obviously ill, and when now there's no doubt about the fact that something terrible has happened to her, and Mark is trying to figure out what it is, enter a telephone call from the mystery writer, the little old lady who's on her 55th mystery, to remind Mark of the crucial clue. And it seems to me that what we have here is a moment when Agatha Christie herself has to intrude almost in the plot of her novel to give it the proper direction in order to get it resolved. And that there, what she begins is the Christieization of the book she has been writing in a somewhat different vein simultaneously. One of the things that's also interesting about what goes on in this novel is that there really two novels going on here. There's a, as there are two mysteries going on, there are also two novels, though they're not exactly connected. The mysteries in this novel are a function of the fact that what's operative here is, is some detective to find out who did it, the professional detective Lejeune, and another detective, Ginger Corrigan and Dane, Dane, Mrs. Dane Calthorpe and, and Mark Easterbrook, to find out how it was done so that the action is divided into two categories that then have to be explored by different detectives and resolved by different detectives in different ways. There are also two novels going on simultaneously. There's the major novel, the, the activities of Mark Easterbrook and Ginger Corrigan and the uh, customer relations, customer reactions, classified world of the pale horse. And then on the outskirts of things, there's this novel that's being written by Ariadne Oliver that's called The White Cockatoo and that involves certain kinds of characteristics which are related to the novel which we are reading. That, Miss, that Mrs. Oliver is working on a book which is in some way a version of the novel that Christie herself is writing, since it's a misdirection novel in which murder is apparently carried out by remote control and by some kind of scientific trick which has to be disguised by a stalking horse, and in which Mark Easterbrook initially goes into Ariadne's world to talk to her about a bazaar he wants her to attend, a benefit where he wants her to sign books, and she talks to him briefly and then gets an idea for the novel and how she's going to resolve it and pushes him out into the world as if he were now about to participate in that novel she herself is writing. So that it seems to me in the novel that Ariadne um, Oliver is writing, we have a kind of paradigm in part for the novel that Christie is writing 
at least as an Agatha Christie form, though Mark Easterbrook's novel is finally more complex and more interesting because it involves us with characters we care about. It takes the crime of murder into a much more expansive realm. It touches upon forces of evil which now seem not located in a single individual, but perhaps there in the whole society as a, a, together, and which focuses, interestingly enough, even on a, a work like Macbeth calling forth ideas about witches and supernatural evil and uh, the, the powers of evil to affect good and wipe them out in various ways, all of this brings us to a world in which we feel much more complexity of motive, much more range of danger, and much more potential violence than we ordinarily feel. The killer turns out, of course, in this novel to be the usual Agatha Christie killer, a least likely suspect, a little man who testifies that he saw the killer, a witness who comes forward to draw attention to himself and who takes pride in his apparent ability to remember things and identify faces. He's the least likely suspect also perhaps because we may unconsciously associate him with Poirot. Um, the, the particulars of the novel which seem to me to be raised but not resolved in any adequate way in this work are particulars which have to do with what it means to have an organization for hire that works murder by contract for people who want to get rid of somebody close to them who has money and whose death they can profit from. At the end, we're told that Osborne did it all and went around and introduced the poison. But of course, Osborne was helped by all this organization that included Bradley and Thursa Gray and uh, the people who work for customer reactions classified. And in addition, we wonder what is, what is to be done with the people who have profited from all the murders that, were, that appeared on that list. The novel, of course, works in other ways with a kind of Agatha, classic Agatha Christie plot because we do have clues, because we do have the list of names which have to be brought in some way to meaning. But that the, the particulars of the novel seem to me finally divided against themselves in a very interesting way. And one of the ways in which it seems to me Christie focuses those differences of uh, novels is in the way in which she gives us the self-reflective narrative of Mrs. Oliver. At the, and, and I want to talk about its particulars now because in obvious ways it's a commentary on the novel we're, we're reading and is in some way that novel. Mrs. Oliver is, of course, a character who has written 55 detective novels, who writes uh, in ways that depend upon misdirection, and who, uh, who is uh, a, char a character trying to figure out how to make sense of the work she's doing now, which she conceives of as a novel which is uh, uh, one in which the murder is done by either poison or a blunt instrument. She tells us she has to go back to all those conventional things that she ordinarily uses because that's what she feels comfortable with. But the poison and blunt, in blunt instrument have to be covered up in some obvious way by a misdirection plot, which she's still trying to conceive of, but which she thinks of finally as being accounted for in a kind of silly way by a cricket ball. The, the fact that she tells us that she doesn't ordinarily write about places like a Chelsea coffee house, I think shows us something about her commentary on what she's doing here and her particular experience of that novel writing. And in addition, the fact that she remarks about the fact that the weapon she ordinarily uses is either poison or a blunt instrument signals to us by way of a hint that that's in fact what the murder weapon, the murder instrument will be in this novel when it's finally revealed to be an Agatha Christie novel. She's having trouble getting it started. She calls it the white cockatoo. 
And she talks about the fact that the real problem in doing any mystery novels like the one she writes is the problem of understanding how you hide the murder. She says doing the murder is easy. You just administer poison. She doesn't, in fact, ever finally explain to us how Osborne gets the poison into Ginger's system, puts it in toothpaste or something, as if that were an easy thing to do. But she says it's the covering up that's difficult. And she talks about what she's, she's trying to do as he goes to visit her. She says she needs a kind of stalking horse. She needs a kind of misdirection, a kind of cover, which it turns out is, of course, the pale horse. And that the pale horse is the way in which characters in this novel are misled into thinking that the force which works the murder is somehow both scientific and psychological since it works on a human death wish or on some kind, out of some kind of rays or with super superstitions. In addition, The White Cockatoo, interestingly enough, is a novel which appears at the end of this book as one she's just published when the book is finished. Moreover, when at a crucial moment in the novel, Ginger and Mark Easterbrook meet together to have lunch and decide that they're going to work together to try to solve this murder. The restaurant they eat in is called the White Cockatoo. It's almost as if they've gotten caught inside Mrs. Oliver's novel, which is, I think, in fact, what's happened to them. In addition, in the early portion of the novel, she does give us a number of Agatha Christie-like hints which operate in the same way that the hints at the beginning of the murder of Roger Ackroyd operates. She tells us, for instance, when Mark Easterbrook looks at the world of violence around him as he sees that violence, in the machinery of everyday life, the jet planes which scream overhead, the uh, world of, um, of trains which rumble through tunnels or big trucks which shake the foundations of our houses, he talks about the fact that evil has always operated in such a way as to appear initially to be more powerful than it actually is, and that at the end, in all of his experience, it turns out to be just a man dressed up in red tights or a ham actor, which is another key since Osborne is somebody who tried to make his living initially as an actor and who failed. That one of the things that's also interesting about the novel is that when they meet Venables, this unusual character who has in some unknown way accumulated a large fortune by an unknown means which might have something to do with running a murder for hire organization and turns out only to be something so good hearted as knocking off a number of banks, when we meet Venables, he talks at length about the power of evil and about how dangerous it is and about how it threatens the human society. And in fact, Venables' speech about the forces of evil and about the way in which the world we live in is a world that's like a jungle is a speech that belongs more appropriately, it seems to me, in a novel of American detective fiction than in English detective fiction. So that Venables, who's presented to us as a kind of potential master criminal, speaks for a kind of view of evil and violence that's much more wide-ranging than Christie ordinarily enters into, gets into her novels. And in addition, Venables is mentioned by people as somebody that, uh, that Ariadne Oliver might be able to work into her novel as an interesting figure, a mystery man. And in fact, that's exactly what she finally does with him. She finally uses him in the novel as a figure of great mystery and force and power who may be the figure, seems to be the figure, only the, the only person in the novel we can see who seems to have the intelligence, the power of planning, and the kind of certainty of, of uh, 
self-confidence that would enable him to run a murder for hire organization. So that Venables is used as a kind of instrument for this particular novel as Ariadne Oliver uses it and as Mark Easterbrook is used as she pushes him out of her room when she's ready to write again which is in a sense what she's really doing at that point in the novel since she's pushing him forward through the novel she's going to write. Well, I want to return now to close by talking about that roundabout conversation that Ariadne Oliver has when she calls Mark Easterbrook to tell him about the fact that this, is, that, that this clue about the missing hair is tremendously important. Because it seems to me that the conversation not only is the moment when the world of an Agatha Christie novel intrudes upon a world much more complicated and much more modern than Agatha Christie uh, finally works with, but it's also a moment when, in paradigm, she gives us a kind of characterization of what ordinarily happens in her novels. Because the telephone call, in a very short space of time, is a kind of major tactic of delay or retardation. That in fact it's almost as if Christie is playing with, in a kind of self-conscious way, the form she usually uses when she writes detective novels. By suggesting the way in which she misleads the detective and the reader, or at least misleads the reader, by dropping too many clues, by retarding the action by various interruptive, trivial details, some of which may be important and some of which are not important. So that when the telephone call comes to Mark Easterbrook, what we notice about it is that Ariadne Oliver is calling to give him the crucial bit of information that will resolve the whole problem of Ginger's sickness and the way the murder is done. Namely, that hair falls out. It's the fact that Mark hasn't been able to make, uh, to, to recognize as important because he's Mark Easterbrook and not Hercule Poirot. But that what's interesting about that telephone call is that it is, it is an incredible series of retards. That it is one massive delay while information is nominally being presented. I actually went through the text of that telephone call to look at it and I have 26 different delays in the course of one telephone call. I'd like for you, when you go back, to look at this novel. You can count them yourself. You may get 25 or less than I got. But what happens is that Ariadne Oliver calls up, and she's trying to say the simplest kind of thing. But because she's Ariadne Oliver, because she's Agatha Christie, she can't give you the information in the simplest kind of way. That what she does for a living is to write novels which delay for you the crucial information for 180 pages. So now that she's delayed it for 180 pages, she's going to give us, as a kind of playful exercise, it seems to me, a recapitulation of that process of delay by giving us a telephone conversation in which Mrs. Adney goes to incredible lengths and digressions before she finally gives Mark the crucial information. Remember, the phone rings and he's about to leave because he wants to see what he can do to help Ginger. He's rushing off to see her and she says, it's Ariadne Oliver. And he says, oh yeah, I'm delighted to talk to you, but I'm busy right now. She says, oh, this is important. So she freezes him there with the fact that it's important. But because she's a little old lady and because she's an Agatha Christie surrogate, she has to enact for us the process of what happens in an Agatha Christie novel by retardation. She then carries on a conversation in which every time she starts to say something, she gets sidetracked by something. She says, well, Millie was sick. She had tonsillitis, you know, and I had to get a new maid, and I had to go for an advertisement to these places, and they always tell you you can't have any help, but we'll do the best we can. And she goes on and on and on in this roundabout way about how because Millie wasn't there she had to get help from somebody else that made her think about the help that Mrs. Fontaine or somebody else had had to call in and then she remembered how Mrs. Fontaine had looked and she keeps telling Mark who keeps trying to leave but this is important I haven't said what I mean to say yet you've got to listen and finally she says her hair was falling out 
She could, of course, called and given the same information in 10 seconds. But, of course, I think it's partly that Agatha Christie is giving us the mind of a little old lady, which often works in digressive ways. But also, more importantly, it does seem to me that she's playing with her own form here and, in part, dealing with the problem of how she's resolved these two novels, which have been running consecutively with one another, by sort of finally reducing them, reducing the chaos, the violence, the disorder, the widespread murderousness of the world that Mark East Brooke and Ginger find themselves in, a world where, in fact, the detective really and truly is threatened by murder, by making it back into a regular Agatha Christie novel, The White Cockatoo, The Pale Horse, the two novels' titles are even similar, by emphasizing in a kind of moment of paradigm the sort of basic retardation that goes on in Ag any Agatha Christie novel as it's characterized here on the telephone. So it seems to me that once again, though more than usual, Agatha Christie works with potential real danger, violence, corruption, evil, something she focuses on over and over again in this novel, and then turns away from that to a kind of affirmation of relatively simplistic reduction of that evil to a problem which can be located in a single person and finally exercised so that the world all turns right at the end. We don't quite know what's happened to all these other people. They just disappear from the novel. At the end of the novel, we return to the pale horse and Ginger is working to bring up from the picture, the picture underneath, the truth of what really was there overlying the dark, overpainted surfaces of things. In that moment, we see that uh, a metaphor for the image of what she and Mark have finally done, but we don't know what's happened to Thursa Gray and to Bradley and to all those people who were part of the organization of murder for hire that Osborne, we are told, is the single murderer for, in spite of the fact, of course, that there were a good many more murderers in this novel than Osborne. Thank you.